Welcome to the Sexy Beings Clubhouse Room. I'm Alex Pruitt. I'm a certified sex, love, and relationship coach and reality guide. I work with men, women, and couples who want to move out of their old toxic patterns, traumas, and beliefs to create relationships from a place of deep connection, pleasure, and fulfillment, whether with themselves or others. Today, I'm joined by Rachel Rose. Rachel, do you want to give a quick introduction of yourself? Sure, yeah. I'm Rachel Rose. I work with uh, women who have gone through uh, domestic or narcissistic abuse. I help them not only heal from the trauma that they went through, but also uh, help them find self-love and a sense of self and who they are moving forward in their future. Beautiful. And as always, thank you for being here with me today. Uh, Today, our topic is grieving in relationships. I'm going to let you talk a little bit about what this means to you since you're the one who picked our topic for the week. Sure. Yeah. So it's something that's been coming up in a lot of the conversations I have in my work um, that you know, grieving after a relationship is, is commonly known, but, um, you know, I deal with a lot of people who were in relationships for far longer than they probably would like to have been in that Mm -hmm. relationship. And a lot of the time, at least the last stretch of it, it was almost like they were grieving the end of their relationship before it was even over. Yeah. And that was something that I wanted to touch on is we don't realize that sometimes we're grieving in a relationship before the relationship has actually come to its end. And what comes up for us in those moments and what we do really impact the outcome of our futures as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so as I've, I've thought around this, cause I, I thought about the aspect of like, yes, when I've been in relationships, right. And especially if I was the one who ended up ending the relationships, mm-hmm. like I could recognize a grieving process beforehand. It's kind of that, that aspect of like slowly letting it go. Yeah. Right. Um, which tends to feel much harder when you're the one who's now like being broken up with, like you haven't gone to process. Um, But in that, I also recognized that there can be stages of the relationship itself that like the relationship may not be ending in full, Mm -hmm. but it's transitioning and transforming. So like Mm -hmm. there can be a grief process around the letting go of what that relationship looked like right yeah compared to what it's evolving into as well not necessarily that whole like epitomal end of like this relationship is gone you no longer have this connection with this person at all right yeah it's a you know we are constantly growing as people and Mm -hmm. if if you're in a long-term relationship I mean you're not going to be the same two people that you were when you first started in the relationship yeah so there is grieving in relationships even ones that don't end like you said and it's it's a it's a balance it's it's neither good nor bad i mean there are some situations where that grieving is coming from a place of ending mm-hmm. in a bad i guess quote unquote bad way i'm not sure there's yeah. really a good or bad but yeah it's just our perception of what that means right yeah just a moment i'm so sorry my client is once again getting the time wrong no and that that brings me around to um yeah that idea of the grieving process itself I do think it's important to clarify, and this comes up because of a workshop I took previously for uh, trauma training I went through, 
and they actually had a woman present on the grief process and grieving and that's like we can end up identifying grief as an emotion itself or grief is actually a set of emotions that come up I don't know what your your knowledge or background is with the grief process specifically or those feelings of grief yeah um just just a moment I'm sorry I have to send an mm -hmm. email to a client really quick I apologize okay. So I'm just I'm almost done. So sorry about that. Uh, could you repeat your question one more time? Um, so my my understanding of the grief process, right, is because I mean, I know I have expressed the feeling of grief, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that grief itself isn't a feeling. It's actually a set of emotions. Yes. yes. And then that falls into what's considered the grieving process. And that's I was trying to look up a quick um pictogram and it's it's interesting because now as I'm looking at this there's like different little images being like the five stages of grief the seven stages of grief the nine stages of grief and I'm trying to remember I think the one I knew was five stages not seven or nine so it's interesting that that's gotten broken down further mm -hmm. um but those those initial ones are denial anger bargaining depression and acceptance mm -hmm. but in those those are all their own sets of feelings and they don't necessarily come in any certain order correct and yeah. so they can they can be fluctuated and moved through and like you can move through one think it's done and then it comes back through in a smaller wave again later on or maybe it just needed to process through in that one way right um that's each, yeah. each person's experiences their own in that right and yeah there it's all their own entities and emotions and and there's yeah, you're right there's like five or seven of the stages of grief nowadays mm -hmm. um it reminds me of um i'm sure you may, you may not have read it but you know of it uh the story of the odyssey mm -hmm. um so odysseus returns home to find seven suitors trying to take his wife from him basically um and he has to slay them in order to gain his home back mm -hmm. um and that represents all of the things that you know th those you know stages of grief in order to find that place of of home feeling within yourself yeah um and in in it is a metaphorical annihilation in, in many respects like odysseus literally had to slay them like he had to kill them mm -hmm. and there was no like bargaining with them or you know just be like hey get out of my house the only way for them to open up a pathway for a place of home or a place of peace was to just completely kill them um and obviously that's metaphorical so yeah <laughs> like that that represents certain things of letting go mm -hmm. Um, and you have to work in, in that case, there were seven and you know, that's, that's hot debate on whether or not there are five stages of grief or more. Um, and one could say like what you were saying is that there are five stages and then maybe the other two in that instant, in that story and metaphor could be the reappearing of, of the, you know, little bits that you were talking about. Um, I don't think well, it's the important the other yeah the other 
um, like, so the seven stage grief, it adds in shock mm -hmm. as a state and testing, which yeah. can both also make sense. I just hadn't heard them particularly, but I mean, usually when there is that like bigger jolt in the system, like if you mm -hmm. experience a breakup, like somebody comes to you and they're like, I want to file for divorce, whatever it is. Like, even if you knew, like a part of you knew that that was coming, it can still feel like a shock in the system. So it makes sense that that would be incorporated in there as well. Um, yeah. But I'd say and there's definitely the grief cycle without shock. I, I would well. definitely agree. I think there are different levels of intensity depending mm -hmm. on your experience. Like grief, grief has different levels yeah. that you can feel it throughout your life. Like there's grief and, you know, you worked really hard to ace a test and then you got an F or a, you didn't get the score you wanted. You know, there's that grief. Then mm -hmm. there's, you know, the grief of grief of losing a loved one to death. And then there's also the grief of losing a one, loved one because they're choosing to leave you. Yeah. Like it's, it's a, it's subjective to circumstance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I work with uh, women who have gone through narcissistic abuse in those types of relationships. And that type of breakup has a different um, chemical reaction to the body yeah. and the mind than just a normal or quote unquote, normal breakup of someone yeah. not leaving a narcissistic relationship. So that grieving process, I definitely believe would have all seven. Yeah. Versus no, we dated for a couple of months and now we're breaking up like that. That maybe not. That wouldn't be such a high intensity grief. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that depends on the levels of attachment that have been formed. Right. And how much um, your your own inner home. Right. Or the thing that feels like home is placed into another person um yeah I've been listening to a book and it's called Welcome Home but she's she's going over the idea of like creating your home in yourself yeah yeah but goes into depth about talking about how we put our homes or that feeling of home into another person or mm -hmm. another situation or place a job, whatever it may be external to us. Yeah. As having to fulfill that, that need of safety and security. Yeah. I mean, exactly. And that, that's one of the reasons why I find the story of Odysseus's homecoming so beautiful mm -hmm. is it's depicted as that external thing. So I, it's, I can understand why it's so easily confused and people, you know, believe that is what they're seeking when they're looking for a home because they're seeking mm -hmm. exter externally yeah and that someone else will bring that for them um but the whole story is metaphor oh yeah and and you know psychology <laughs> itself derives from greek mythology and like the psyches and archetypes and all of that like that's all mm -hmm. from greek mythology so it's it's a Not, you know, I think a lot of people not only take it literal, mm -hmm. but also I think there's something easier about attempting to find it externally mm -hmm. than you have so many excuses that you can make to validate why you haven't found it yet. Yeah. But if you're doing the work within yourself, you kind of only have yourself to blame if you're quote unquote, not successful. Um, and then that is a grief of a relationship within yourself, mm -hmm. which is the, my personal opinion for my own personal experiences, the hardest one to let go of and, and, cope with yeah yeah it can be and that I mean to me that falls into the realm of what shadow work can be right it's mm -hmm. all those 
potential lost aspects of mm -hmm. yourself that were pushed down, repressed, forgotten yeah. along the way. Um, yeah. You're like, in my experience, your own needs being put aside for others, right? I fell very highly into codependent relationships in the past and place very heavily placing that that space of home, my own self-worth, my lovability, like all the things into other people. Yeah. And that that definitely created um what I would consider fragments. Right. And like a, a fragmented version of self. Cause that's and it was it's been hard to to repiece that. Like that's been years of work and I mean I, I think that's in some way something we're we all go through, right? That's otherwise we wouldn't have all the the archetype work and different pieces of shadow work and mm -hmm. probably as much need on psychology as we do currently have and how much that's showing up in our current societal atmosphere. Yeah. For creating this like wholeness and empowerment and self again yeah and it's there's no time limit on that like there's no. there's no guarantee and that's what I I you know I think makes it the scariest or hardest mm -hmm. to to pursue is I I personally believe I'm going to be doing it the rest of my life I don't think that there's gonna be a day you know three years down the line that I'm like okay I'm I'm done I'm fully yeah. healed <laughs> like my grief is over <laughs> I think yeah no, I agree yeah so it's it it uh so I understand why like it's yes it is very prevalent nowadays and more and more people are opening up to attempting it mm-hmm But I'm curious how many of them actually stick with it. Well, and I think, like, so I would say that, yes, there, there are the people who go into it are wanting a quick fix, mm -hmm. which that's there, there isn't quick fixes in mm -hmm. the healing process. Even when you like, if you have a broken bone, there's not a quick fix for that. Your body is really good at healing itself. Yeah. Right in those ways but like your bone still needs to go through its like rest phase and then you're going to be going through the phase of like slowly rebuilding that strength and flexibility with like doing small exercises small tasks right and mm -hmm. then that's gonna evolve over time into you having hopefully your range of motion back right and your strength back and the yeah. The interesting thing, though, when you even break it down to the very physical of a broken bone is mm -hmm. once that heals properly, right, mm -hmm. and has been given that time and space to do so, that point where it broke is actually stronger than yeah. it ever was in the past. Yeah. And I, I think there is that to be considered for anybody who is on these paths right and is Definitely. going through that healing journey and going through the grieving process is like yeah it may fucking hurt right now yeah right the the rest period may feel exorbitantly longer than like you think it should your brain isn't a great judge of that. <laughs> your, I your brain, know, right? Yeah. Your brain would say, this is fixed tomorrow on everything, including a broken bone, if it could. But in that, like, once you actually move through those phases and those cycles of the healing process, like, there is such a higher level of resiliency mm -hmm. and strength that is there. Mm-hmm in going through those processes. Definitely. And, you know, something that I, I talk about a lot when I'm telling people about what I do in my coaching practice is uh, 
like that's the last stage of transformation is, is when you have fully embraced that strength. Mm. Now it's a learning process. You have to remaster yourself as mm. that newfound strength. You can't go about life. One well, can't maybe is the wrong word. It is unwise to go about life exactly the same way you just, you have been. You're mm -hmm. not the same person. You're now this, this stronger healed version of yourself that in, in many respects, you know, you have to let, like, I guess this is where the slaying of those seven suitors comes in. So you have to let go and let the past, you know, let the past you, the person that you no longer are die mm -hmm. and transform so that you can embrace the strengths that come with that. And that, in and of itself is hard work. Yeah. Because then you're, gr you're grieving your yourself, person that used to exist that no longer does. So I'm curious for you, um, have you found anything that helps that process feel like less of hard work? Because we it, like the the mm -hmm. that feel I don't know when I hear hard work like there's like this heavy weight in my body and like it it feels like being like stuck in the mud mm -hmm. right like very thick <laughs> dense mud like where it's like that very mm -hmm. slow slog forward I'm just curious if you've come across anything I know I've come across a few things yeah I, I like bouncing ideas <laughs> of course I think it really varies person to person mm -hmm. um but it's also it's a it's a lifestyle change and you have to want to do the things that you're putting into your life mm -hmm. like if you're not someone who likes to go running but you want to like be healthier physically then maybe you should try swimming or mm -hmm. or you know some other form of it like there are yeah. so many different types of exercise you can do that doesn't have to be running yeah um and so you it's exploration it's a lot like that that it, and that's the fun part and like you you have to go at it with like that childhood or childish like creative like wonder like yes. you are now reborn so you get to reintroduce all of these things you know it could have been like seven years ago I absolutely hated rock climbing mm -hmm. and then I went through all of these things in life and now that like adrenaline or you know something about it like it that thrill now it's it's my my peace my pastime yeah and it may not be as well like it could be you for the last seven years, it has been, and now it's not. Mm -hmm. And you can either slowly try and reclaim it, which could serve you or not. It really depends on the person, yeah. but also exploring to other avenues. There are other forms of, you know, exercise like rock climbing, like you try skiing or, you know, kayaking. There are other forms that you might end up loving. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that's my two cents on that is, is tune into your childish, childish creativeness and explorational wonder. Yeah. And well, do and it with intention to just figure it out, to, to fall and scrape your knee. Like the first one you try may not be the one that, you know, hits home for you and it could be the 100th. Well, and I, to me, I think that's, I, I just refer to it as play. Yeah. Right? But it, it's bringing it back to this idea of playing with life, playing in your reality, right? Mm -hmm. And that's like with the, the concept of exercise. One of the things I did forever ago um, is when my son was very young, so he would have been in a stroller, right? I, I previously had... I used to run my dogs. I would wear rollerblades. They would be in harnesses and they would pull. I 
did not think it was a great mom move to incorporate a stroller into that scenario. So I had to figure out something else. The dogs had actually started making <clears throat> yard breaks, being huskies, and were tearing up things like crazy because they were bored. They had all this energy they needed to express out of their bodies. <clears throat> In that, I was like, I was like, okay, like, I need to start running. I have hated running my entire life. Like it is something that I had in there as like, I cannot do this thing. Mm -hmm. And so if I think about just running, it's something that like, like my body, like just feels like it hits a wall with yeah. every single yeah. step mm -hmm. and it's not pleasurable and it doesn't, it's not a type of challenge. Like I even really wanted to focus on because it's such a wall with every single step mm -hmm. the twist I made for myself on it is for whatever reason I decided oh I want to be able to sing and run simultaneously <laughs> right <laughs> I wanted to be able to do this one not only because I thought the endurance of being able to do that was phenomenal for the people who can like talk or like you look at performers on stage who are singing and like dancing and running around the stage. Mm -hmm. That is a huge amount of endurance, but it also pushed other edges for me that I recognized one in like being that person who looks like they're like talking to themselves, let alone if somebody heard me singing, right? I had such a big block around <laughs> people uh -huh. hearing my yeah. singing voice but like so being that potential center of attention but then also like singing in public spaces as well because I would sing but it was only with myself it was only in the shower only in my car only in spaces I thought other people couldn't hear me mm -hmm. right but with that that twist to it like did I, I didn't get to where I was running like miles, right? I was walking miles in a day, which I still do with my dogs. Yeah. But it made it fun because there were fun edges to explore there. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a slow, like little stepwise in. And like, I got to where I could run and sing for like 10 seconds before like, my body like wanted to like collapse and I needed to go back to walking. And like, I think I got up to like a minute or something, Yeah. but I, I was happy with that. Like that, that was phenomenal, especially for being somebody who didn't enjoy that space, but it took me being willing to play with it as well and make it fun in my own way. Not the ways that other people were like, telling me I needed to run or had to run like I used I used running tools and stuff like that I got a running app that was supposed to help like condition your body for that but it was more just like I noticed the thought of like I I should probably like try running now my body's warmed up enough right yeah and even if it was for 10 steps then the next time I'd be like okay we're gonna take 20 steps running right it was just it was that slow challenge and like then I got to a point where I'd set this little goal and I'd actually go twice as long that's amazing and it was great like but it it made it fun yeah especially because I wasn't doing it how anybody else told me I had to or should or can or can't <laughs> perfect right and I think I think that is really really important is like all of these paths are our own. So mm -hmm. finding those ways to play at life and like getting, getting very, very curious about what your experience is and those things you enjoy can, can help lift that weight. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I think there's, you know, like, there, like you're, what you're talking about is like you pushed yourself, and I, I want to emphasize that pushing yourself and forcing yourself are two very different things. Yes. And you weren't forcing yourself to enjoy running. You were pushing yourself to 
try out something that you'd wanted for yourself and to try out different ways of achieving that for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I ended up for myself, like just completely eradicating running. I tried it. I did it for like almost a year, six months. I would run for 30 minutes every single day. And I like, you know, for maybe a middle stretch of that, I was like, oh, I don't hate this as much. Mm -hmm. And then I just started hating it again more and more. And I was like, well, and I also live in a, a very rainy city. So like, yes, I, <laughs> thank you. Pacific Northwest. Around, I was like, this is not, I don't want this. I don't like being out in the rain. Like this is making me hate it even more. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, I wanted to get into shape and cause I, I liked what was happening for me emotionally when I was exercising, like I was yeah. happier. I was feeling, my body was feeling better. I was eating healthier, like I wasn't craving like fast food and stuff. Like I was overall enjoying the outcomes of my efforts. Yeah. But I was, I just couldn't stand running and I decided to try swimming. And so I signed up for a gym membership and I went swimming and I remember being really uncomfortable in the beginning because I didn't really Mm -hmm. want people staring at me and I'm in my bathing suit and I'm swimming in a public place. And then there was one moment where I just laid back in the water and was just like, I'm going to let myself relax and be at peace for this moment. And it was just like, oh, and I like imagined myself just like surrounded by lotus flowers. And I was like, okay, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And so it took me like two years to figure out that swimming was my route because I knew exercise in some form was. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that, that could change again. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And it has Uh, many times throughout my life. Yeah. yeah. Like a couple of years before that, like before I started running, I was doing mixed martial arts, uh, four to six days a week. Um, and I've, I've done pole dancing and belly dancing and soccer yeah, I think that's in like looping this back to that aspect of grieving in relationships. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of that grief cycle pulls you away from pleasure, right? Yeah, yeah. And enjoyment. And like there, there was a point that I've gone through with different grief cycles where like it's hard to like want to get out of bed, right? Yeah. To mm-hmm. even go brush your teeth. And that's, I actually had gotten a like grief workbook. Cause I was like, I want tools. Like I had other tools, but they weren't, they weren't flowing to me like they would when I'm not deep in that space. So I, I needed some outside resources yeah. to, to help remind me. Um, but like one of them, it was like, oh, like even if it was the littlest thing, like what can you celebrate that you like did for yourself today? And like one of them one day was literally brushing my teeth. Yeah. There was another time where it was like, I took a shower. Yep. <laughs> um, there's, I mean, there was like, I got up and like got dressed. I like put on my makeup for me. Like even if I didn't leave the house. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It was just, It's those little things and that that can be very hard to be in those places, not not only when you're just on your own, but like if you have relationships with other people, if you're a parent and need to potentially be providing care for another being. And I think one point on that, because I've gone through some heavy grief cycles since my son was born is if you have outside resources, like your parents, friends, other family members, whatever it may be, that can offer you support in those times by helping to caretake your children, (laughs) please, please, please give yourself that space and that support. Yeah. And I, I know that that specific issue has come up a lot with the women that I work with 
mm-hmm. is they have people who are offering a hand of help, but they their their grief has a lot of shame around it. Yeah. And so being open to accepting that help mm-hmm. makes them feel like they're creating a burden on that person. Yeah. And that that will somehow come back to bite them in the ass in the future. Well, and I, I feel like that comes back to those spaces, our very first talk of transactional relationships, yeah. transactional love. Yeah. And that's like, yes, if that comes back to bite you on the ass later on, like where that person tries to hold that against you, that they gave you this thing at one point in time, like you don't to me, you don't give a gift, right, of support expecting that it has to be repaid. If there's that yeah. expectation, then it's agreed upon beforehand, like, hey, I can help you out with this right now. Later on, I may need help or something, right? It's not something you hold over the other person. Right. Right. And that's, for me, I know being willing to ask for help, and it's still not easy, I will not deny that, was one of my things. Like, I felt like I had to do it all on my own so much of the time. Yeah. But it was it was actually those spaces of, like, my grief cycles <laughs> where I was, like, I was, like, I literally, like, I can't function. I can't do this. Mm-hmm. Like, I know like during my divorce, my system went into collapse and there was a point in time, like I literally laid in bed just crying Mm -hmm. and in pain like that. And that's what I had. Like that's, those were the emotional spaces I needed to let out and move through at that point in time. And when I would have to like suck it up and then go function by the end of the day, I was so exhausted because I was holding everything back. Yeah. And hadn't let myself move through that space. That is, uh, I had a, a wonderful session with one of my coaches over the weekend that was very similar to needing to open up and let yourself feel in those spaces. Mm-hmm. And It is, it is a scary thing to do as it's not the funnest either. It's like a lot of, a lot of healing is just learning to become comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. And not knowing where it needs to be hardened and where it doesn't like, uh, what you were saying about healing the bones yeah. is just where the break happened is where that hardening comes into it. It's not like the entire, like, like finger bone has gotten calloused over mm-hmm. or new, new growth, but knowing where that pain and hardening is supposed to be, I guess maybe that's not the right word supposed to, but um, finding the balance within it of that hardening so that you don't come out of it bitter. Yeah. In your grieving process. Like, yes, you've, you've gone through something that's hardened part of you, but not all of you. Well, and I, I think even if we bring it back to the idea of looking at the, like the very physical bone break, Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And that's, I surprisingly have not broken a bone in my life, but I did recently sprain an ankle. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but in that, that's all the muscles around that injury area, all the skin, the myofascial layers, all of that will actually contract and stiffen and hold mm-hmm. because it wants to protect that area of the break. So healing can occur. And 
this same sort of thing happens in the physical body when there is emotional traumas, mental traumas, these spaces of grief and loss as well. Um, but we don't we don't necessarily notice it as much, but it becomes a physical holding in our body. And like maybe we experience that in our low belly, right? That yeah. maybe that's in around our chest, our yeah. upper back and shoulders is a huge area for people to hold tension and stress same mm -hmm. with the um glute muscles but our physical body will actually do that same sort of clamp down and hold and mm -hmm. if we don't allow those emotions to flow right and give that energy that release mm -hmm. that holding will keep staying there Right. And it can yeah. add to that even emotional rigidity that people end up experiencing in feeling more bitter, right? And resentful. Yeah. Yes. And things as well. And it it becomes a I mean, our whole body is like its own little universe. But mm -hmm. in that, like it it creates a bigger impact out in our system and then because like we're holding on to that and not not allowing ourselves to go through the grieving process that can end up impacting relationships with external to us right so it doesn't just impact our world inside it, it can have an effect on our other relationships mm -hmm. it can have an impact on our home like i know there was one point during a past relationship where I lived with a partner and he was significantly messier than I was. <laughs> I like a tiny home. Um, but in that, I would come home in the evening from work and there'd be like piles of clothes, there'd be garbage, there'd be like dirty dishes around, stuff like that. And I would end up feeling chaotic in my mind because of the physical mess in my house space right mm -hmm. and I noticed like if he didn't clean it up like I would feel like I had to clean it up not to clean up after him but because otherwise like I would feel chaotic inside my own body and I was like, this, this isn't even my stuff, <laughs> but it's, it's impacting my system. Right. And one of the reasons that's a trigger for me is because if I was in that home by myself and it got to that state, right. Mm -hmm. It's because there's something that is imbalanced in my system because I'm not able to provide that care for myself, let alone the care for my space around me. Yeah. I'm just paying attention Yeah. to both your body and your mind. So I think, you know, bringing it back to, you know, grieving, mm -hmm. We, you know, these are concepts that don't have tangibility, don't have image. Yeah. Like there, you could pinpoint where you feel it in your body and try and place an image onto it using imagination. Mm -hmm. But when it's things that are, are invisible to us, it's, it makes it so much harder to notice when they're coming about in, like you said, the many forms that grief can show up in. Yeah. And so paying attention to what's going on in yourself not only helps yourself, but also your environment. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, and it, it creates, once again, those spaces of curiosity. 
Yeah. And when we can come to points of curiosity, there's, we're not judging what's coming up, right? That's curiosity is a space where like you ask questions, you want to explore what's there. Um, there's not, there's not as much of that rigidity yeah in that curiosity um but when when you do that to me like playing in those spaces it leads to a greater like availability to find acceptance for what's coming up to find understanding for what's coming up and even to find love yeah for what's there it's a coming out of that fixed mindset Mm -hmm. so if you tell yourself a fixed truth whether it be true or not in your being is irrelevant but if it's a fixed truth it it paves the road so if you're telling yourself this is how it is i'm never going to have this then you're fixing it. You're never going to have it. Mm -hmm. So it creates that bitterness. So having that creativity, like you're talking about, creates um, malleability yeah. for your for your potential in the future, and to explore and play and be curious. Because I'm, I'm literally imagining just like a bunch of little kids playing on a in a sandbox or something and then this like new park or sandbox just magically appears next to them <laughs> and they can either be curious and be like "Ooh, what's it going to be like and there's a magical sandbox so anything yeah. can happen there but I don't think every single child that's in that sandbox would have the courage and curiosity to want to explore it yeah. And so that, that's okay too. Some people need to stay in their sandbox for a little while, but then there's so much curiosity that you can have inside that sandbox as well. Mm -hmm. I just always urge people to be curious and willing to adapt to change or to try out change. And it might be that you don't like it and you want to go back to your sandbox and that's okay. Yeah, but at least you tried. Well, I think there's there's also like bringing bringing the idea of a sandbox right to yeah to the larger world at hand. It was something that I ended up um, finding a well probably like four years ago now, um, but it was it was this interesting little epiphany, right? And it was. I was walking along and I happened to like notice a tree and mm -hmm. for whatever reason I looked at this tree and it was like I could see every single leaf on this tree right I could see the like grain of the bark and like so much detail to it and granted this was after some amount of work I'd been doing on bringing focus and attention but like at the moment this happened, I realized, oh, like it's been a really long time since I've actually seen a tree, <laughs> right? And trees are around us all the time, especially in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, I kind of got in the mode where like I would see a big blob of green up top and like a brown blob <laughs> below that and would be tree and didn't give it much attention. Mm-hmm. Right. I, yeah. I didn't pay attention to the smaller pieces that came together to make that whole being. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was like, oh, like I, I literally like put a filter on trees that told me green blob, brown blob tree. And so it became this way of, once again, it's that redefinition to me. I look at it as especially in adult life, removing filters we've imposed mm -hmm. to make, to make that 
input of information manageable. Yeah. Because that's we we are taking in so much sensory stimulus just from vision, let alone you incorporate all the other senses into that. Yeah. From the outside world that like we we can't continue to take it in all at that level but then that ends up narrowing down I think um, most of the time like we're only utilizing like about five percent of the input data like that's what is getting our focus and that is also where um, working with embodiment practices and where you're actually getting in touch with the five senses and Mm -hmm. then moving into working with those um the interception so being able to feel your muscles and bones and internal organs and stuff like that can be so valuable because it brings back the focus yeah and it uh i think it helps as well um I guess the best way to put it would be like to, to stabilize and ground yourself instead of mm-hmm. feeling like you're just kind of floating in the ether. Yeah. Like it pulls you back to center um, in whatever I like to call it my universe. It's just my mm-hmm. imagined world. And having grounding is very important and all of that. I was, while you were telling me that I was thinking about something that you'd mentioned to me a couple weeks ago about what serves you now Mm -hmm. you know like it's not about right or wrong like there's nothing right or wrong about you needing to you know like pick your senses and then seeing the green and brown blob at that moment that was a tree like Mm -hmm. that was serving you and then you noticed it and so you, it was no longer serving its purpose. So you reshaped how you were looking at that tree and you started to appreciate it and see it more in a different way. Yeah. And like that, that is the same with the grieving process is mm-hmm. it, certain things serve you in your moment. And then throughout time, they may not serve you anymore. And you have to, you know, like you said, go into your body and find that grounding sense you know figure out where where it lives and reshape it and it's I always want to urge that it doesn't mean that the one that you were doing before was wrong yeah it was served it served you and now it's not and it might you know you might go back to it the same way you were in in the future Mm -hmm. but there is a constant change in what serves you and what is right for your grieving process in that moment. Yeah. And no, nobody else can define what that is Mm -mm. besides the individual. Yeah. I think the, the helpful thing is just that once again, that space of noticing, right. Mm -hmm. And that's like your, your experience is your experience. I mean, that's, one of the things I have thought was interesting through a lot of my life is um, like when I was little, I remember having family members pass away. Right. Mm-hmm. And it, I don't remember like crying or being super sad about it or anything. And I, I was usually more impacted by like pets <laughs> passing away, Yeah, but it, it was something that like passed, relatively quickly and I remember honestly feeling shame that like I wasn't more torn up about it right and even even into my 20s I had a really good friend she had epilepsy she ended up getting drunk and she she either fell off a wall or from a tree or something like that broke her neck they put her into a seizure and she seized until she passed Um, but I remember even in that, so many people around me were so torn up and that's, I, 
I wasn't judging them for being torn up. I was actually judging myself more because for me, it was just kind of like she was like off hitchhiking again because that she had done that after we got out of high school and like I missed her, right? But it wasn't this very big, heavy thing where I'm crying and breaking down, but I, I definitely judged myself in that. Mm-hmm. And being like, is there something wrong with me? But that was just where I was at. It was for whatever reason, those spaces, it was easy for me to let go. Yeah. And then I've had other ones where it was like, I had my my first dog. <laughs> he passed away. And like a year later, I ended up going into the doctor because I was having, like, just breaking down, sobbing randomly right around the one year anniversary of his death. And I was like, I have final exams because I was in school for my bachelor's at the time. And there was, there was nothing wrong with that state. There was nothing wrong with me getting medication at that point because, like, I, I had other things I needed to function around. Thankfully, I also let myself feel those emotions and notice like that I was missing him Mm -hmm. right I actually just had a process a week ago where I had a dream about um somebody who had been my best friend on and off through high school and I haven't talked to them in a while um and I was really missing them and like broke down crying and I mean even that is it's its own little grieving process and thankfully that person is still alive and I I wish them well from all my heart but that that doesn't seem like a space that is conducive for a healthy relationship right now so we're we're taking space yeah but there even in that there's there can be those waves of grief that come up and just letting ourselves connect with them and like cry through them if we need to cry right not not judging that those yeah. emotions are right or wrong is really powerful just allowing it allowing yourself to be however you need to be for yourself through that grieving mm-hmm. process is very important without yeah. judgment without holding back I think that's a really mm-hmm. important one like let's say there are two out of five emotions that you're not willing to feel, but you're willing to allow the other ones to. Yeah. It's actually pretty, I guess you could say dangerous psychologically Mm -hmm. to not allow yourself to feel those two emotions and then feel the others because the Mm -hmm. others will overcompensate. Yeah. And so just let it all feel. Um, and it's terrifying and it's exhilarating and it's happy and it's sad and you might feel a little bit like you're going crazy at times while you're going through all of these different emotions that are coming up for you and allowing yourself to just exist like that and be is is imperative it's crucial yeah no and I think I think in the the upcoming future a good a good topic is going to be around um emotional I'm gonna call it emotional literacy (laughs) (laughs) I like that yeah because I mean there's there's the topics of emotional intelligence but there's there are some profound spaces that come up around when we repress certain emotions and how like yes, it prevents us from feeling that emotion in that point in time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It doesn't, that emotion doesn't go away. Once again, it gets stored in the body, but it also has companion emotions that are related to it that we could deem as good, right? It comes down to that idea of like, I don't want to be feeling this thing. I'm going to push it away. Right. Versus... I want to feel this thing, but it actually dulls them all out. (laughs) So 
I think that's an important topic for the future. I do want to check in with you just because I know that usually around 2 p.m. you need to. Yeah, I do got to get going at 2. Okay. Uh, but I love that idea for our next topic as well. And um, also yes. was thinking about, um, like you were saying about different subcategories to emotions mm-hmm. is that masking as well. Yes. In an emotional literacy or in emotional intelligence is what it shows up as it in the moment mm-hmm. versus what it truly is. Like a yes. lot of, a lot of people show up in a moment as angry, but the true emotion behind that is pain or something. I like feel that. like we could go over like 20 episodes just yeah. with that. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> <Exactly>. more. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. All right. So next week's topic next week. is going, we're gonna we're gonna start diving into emotional literacy I like I like that term I'm gonna stick with that one for the topic name but thank it. you so much for joining me today Rachel Rose yes thank you for As having always me. it is a huge pleasure and my pleasure I will see you here next week yeah next week I'll be here right no. all right thank have you for having me have a good afternoon yep bye everyone bye